So the topic today is anxiety disorders, and we're going to be looking at it from a cognitive behavioral point of view. So uh, anxiety is well known. It, is, uh, it has been known for many years also by the psychoanalytic and psychodynamic therapists who looked at anxiety as a very, very important driving force in uh, different disorders. In the past, uh, it's been uh, classified, uh, all the emotional and psychiatric disturbances have been classified into uh, psychoses and neuroses, and a lot of neuroses were uh, connected to anxiety. So uh, what, what used to be called neurotic disorders, a lot of different anxiety disorders these days, and, um, and we're talking 19th century um, clinicians already talking about uh, all sorts of emotional behavioral uh, disorders and then Freud coming along and really uh, putting his emphasis on on the topic talking about uh, about moral anxiety which means that uh, you have forbidden thoughts in the psychodynamic language we're talking about, about anxiety coming from the superego meaning that you feel that you, you shouldn't do these kind of things and you're, you feel shameful and you feel that people may reveal how uh, shameful you are. And, uh, and then uh, neurotic anxiety, meaning that you will not be able to control your impulses. Maybe I'll just, uh, you know, suddenly kiss my teacher. I won't be able to control my impulses and everyone will see my impulses. And that, that's another kind of anxiety that uh, Freud uh, spoke about. And uh, today we have uh, different categories. I'm going to be talking a little about DSM-4 and DSM-5 and how and how uh, things change. But we do have quite a lot of anxiety disorders in uh, DSM-4. Another very important distinction is between fear and anxiety. Now, fear is a very important biological. Uh, factor. We need fear in order to survive. And so uh, once we see danger, a series of things happen, biological, physiological, cognitive, behavioral, that, that are meant to help us survive. So if, for example, we see uh, a large beast like a lion or a tiger in the jungle, then we, it triggers the uh, fight or flight mechanism. I hope that in the case of a lion, it will be flight. And, uh, and then a lot of things happen. First of all, cognitively, we feel fear uh, in a sort of subjective kind of manner. Uh, physiologically, a lot of things happen. So we get an adrenaline rush and adrenaline does a lot of things. It uh, increases our heart rate. It uh, provides us with an anesthetic, a very uh, natural anesthetic, so we won't feel pain. Uh, all the blood goes to the heart, so we can do fast, uh, rapid aerobic kind of work, uh, just running or fighting, you know, two, three minutes, and it's done. That's the way it goes in nature. We don't need much more than that. And so uh, we don't need uh, blood to be in the digestive system, for example. And so all the blood rushes to the heart, all the blood rushes from the periphery, and we, we, we know these symptoms, we know what happens, right? Uh, when the blood rushes from the digestive system, we feel pain in our stomach. Uh, we get all sorts of uh, physiological responses that we don't necessarily want. When blood rushes from the periphery of the body, from the hands, for example, the hands become white, the face becomes white, uh, it becomes colder, uh, we get cold sweat. Um, and, and, and anyone who has experienced a serious injury would know about the anesthetic effect of adrenaline. So you, you, you don't feel the pain. So you're in a total rush and then you, and you don't feel the pain. And then three, four, five hours later, it hits you. You, you can't walk, you can't you know, move your arm. But at the time when it happened, uh, the adrenaline helped you survive. That's the idea. And of course, uh, we have also the behavioral triggers so that we know that uh, we need to 
to run, we need to fight, we need to do something to survive. So a lot of things happen uh, when, uh, when uh, fear is triggered. In anxiety, we see all these uh, physical symptoms, cognitive symptoms, everything is the same, only we don't have this dangerous uh, stimulus. We don't have danger. We, uh, we have subjective, uh, a subjective feeling of danger, which is anxiety, but we don't really have something that is uh, threatening our uh, bodily integrity. And then what happens is, that uh, it, it also doesn't last three minutes. So if we met a rhinoceros in a jungle, you know, it would have been done in three minutes. And uh, most of the day we would continue to just uh, lie around and eat our nuts and stuff like that. But in the modern era, someone who feels anxious feels anxious many, many hours a day. And so we're not well equipped to handle that either. We're supposed to be doing this for three minutes a, a week, maybe, you know, we, we don't want to meet a lion every day. And then all of a sudden, we have it for hours a day, and that is really, really stressful, and it has a lot of impact on us uh, mentally and physically. And so this is how we define anxiety, okay? When it does not correspond to danger, and does, and does cause significant harm to our daily functioning. And it is very, very prevalent. We're talking about 12 to 20% of children having anxiety disorders. It's very common, that's the bad news. The good news, it's very treatable. And we're gonna talk about the, the, the best way known today to treat the anxiety, which is cognitive behavioral uh, and uh, and it doesn't always require a professional. You don't have to see a psychologist for it. A lot of the things, if you understand the principles of how anxiety works, can be done uh, in our day-to-day -day life as parents, as teachers, and so on. So, um, of course, like any other uh, psychological phenomena, when we talk about psychopathology, we're talking about something that interferes with our life. So if, for example, if we talk about cockroaches, you know, they're disgusting. People don't like cockroaches, that's fine. It doesn't have to be an anxiety disorder uh, per se. If you won't leave your house or if you can't sleep because of cockroaches, then it becomes uh, an anxiety disorder. A lot of the times in, in psychology textbooks, for some reason, they talk about being anxious of snakes. You should be anxious of snakes. That's fine. That's not a problem, then, you know, unless you live in Africa and then it, again, it impairs, you know, and you live in your village and you can't walk out of your hut because of, uh, because of your uh, snake anxiety. But for most people, you know, uh, that would not be an anxiety disorder because it doesn't interfere with their daily life. Uh, for most people, uh, being afraid of flights is not uh, uh, an anxiety disorder that disrupts their everyday life because you don't, they don't fly very often. And, then, and so that's another sort of distinction that has to be made. Another very important factor that needs to be reminded that there are developmental fears, meaning that children ages four to six have uh, fears that are developmental. It's nothing to be worried about. You don't need to see a psychologist or a therapist about it. Uh, they're usually afraid of, of the darkness, of animals, of monsters. Uh, these days, clowns and balloons, and who knows what, what we're gonna face next with the coronavirus. But uh, ages four to six, no need for clinical treatment. So I'm gonna show you a few examples of, uh, of the most prevalent anxiety disorders. So the first one we're gonna see is a specific phobia and actually hits exactly the kind of treatment that I'm talking about here, the cognitive behavioral treatment. We're gonna see someone who has a specific phobia from elevators and we, we're gonna see the treatment. So the treatment is, is based on gradual exposure, that's what cognitive behavioral treatment of uh, anxiety disorders is based on. So uh, after um, a while that he's been in treatment, he is now 
going into an elevator despite his uh, phobia, uh, specific phobia of elevators. And he's going to get a lot of support from uh, the people around him. And, uh, and you don't usually get this amount of support when you go into an elevator, but that's the gradual part about this treatment. So you get a lot of support the first time you do it, and then gradually you do it over and over in a variety of settings with less and less support until you can do it on your own. That's the idea of specific phobia. So let's watch this clip. When was the last time you were in an elevator? It's, it's, it's almost as bad as the tunnels. Well, I think, Bill, the time has come. This session becomes challenge night. My challenge is tomorrow, Bill attempts to do the elevator routine with those of us who are available there to cheer him on and support him. Are you willing to give it a shot? I'm, I'm, I'm game for anything. Okay. How are you feeling? A little better today. Last right. night I had a little rough time. Did you think about this yeah. last night? Yes, I certainly did. I didn't sleep at all. You, now, when was the last time you were in an elevator? Tell me in years. Do you know? I'll say eight. How's eight, that? Eight years? Yeah, I'll say six to eight years. Now, listen to me. You have your survival pack. Right. If you start to feel that your throat is closing, you have your lemonade. You know what to do with the brown paper bag. Correct. Okay? Correct. You have your prayers you can say? Oh, I had them memorized. Okay. When you walk into that elevator, and that door closes, right. what will Bill be thinking about? The first thing is going to hit me, that I'm not coming back out. I, I, I'm going to get stuck in there and I'm going to die on the floor. Okay, okay, thank, you. thank you. Come on, Bill. I I'm going to try to put it out of my mind. Go get him. Thanks again. I need all your support. You got it, Bill. We're with you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Still the this far. That's the main feel, thing. You're shaking. That's all right. You're shaking. Have some of your lemonade. Okay. You'll feel better. That's all right. You're trembling. That's all right. I took it out of there. It's supposed to slow it down. <laughs> so what was it like, Bill? It was a lot uh, easier than what I thought, really. I anticipated. I made it more than really what it was. All right. That took about 25 seconds, that ride. Really? Uh, yeah. It seemed a little longer than that It seemed me. longer than 25 yes, seconds? Yes. Yeah, excuse me. And it's no gin in here or vodka, by the way. Okay? <laughs> I just want to let you know. Next <laughs> week, we'll start working on hitting all the elevators on Staten Island. Okay? I made it! The good part about it is we know how to treat the disorders and how to control them so that people do not have to suffer. I'm going to show you now two clips from the movie Copycat with Sigourney Weaver. Sigourney Weaver plays uh, a psychiatrist who is uh, an expert on serial killers. And then uh, she is attacked by a serial killer and develops an anxiety disorder. And we're going to see two features. The first clip is going to show a panic disorder meaning that uh, she hyperventilates, she feels like she's having a heart attack, and that's something that we see in a lot of anxiety disorders. So usually it's a feature of anxiety disorders that you're having panic attacks. So you're, you're, you could have specific phobias with panic attacks. You can have agoraphobia with panic attacks. So that's a specific feature. So uh, in this scene, the cops are coming to get her help on a new serial killer, the copycat, and she doesn't want anything to do with it, and they uh, they sort of stress her, and she gets a panic attack. So let's see that clip. If you don't mind, I have a very busy day. Well, ma'am, that's a hell of an apartment you got here. A hell of an apartment. I guess the books you wrote about these scumbags must have paid pretty well. Now, we can't afford to pay you your usual fee, but you would be so... Hi, as to look. I don't want these here. Would you be more comfortable looking at them downtown? I don't want to see these here. Well, I'll drive you if you prefer. Andy. Andy! 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 All right, it's okay. Wait, I'm here. Wait. Should we call the paramedics? No, no. Just a good old fashioned panic attack. She hyperventilates till she passes out, then her breathing returns to normal, and she's fine. What do we do? She's agoraphobic. She's afraid of spiders, too? She hasn't been out of the house in over a year. She's okay, though, right? She's fine. Half an hour, she'll be singing like a lark. Tell her. 
We're sorry to have bothered her. And finally, from the same movie, we can see Sigourney Weaver and her agoraphobia. What is agoraphobia? Agoraphobia is the uh, when you can't uh, uh, be with, uh, you can't leave your house. You can't be in, in agora is the marketplace. You, so you can't be in crowded places, but, but basically you can't leave the house. That's the idea of agoraphobia. And really, this is the, the most extreme case in anxiety, meaning that Anxiety, as I said, is very, very treatable, especially when you, you when you start when it's uh, small. But if you if you don't attend to it, if you don't work properly, if you don't treat it for for a while, then it spreads. And at the beginning, you you don't want to go to, for example, uh, you don't want to go to friends who have dogs, and then you don't want to go in streets that have dogs, and then. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm describing it very rapidly, but the idea is, but then you can't leave your house anymore. That's, that's the idea. And when it gets to that, it gets, gets very, very difficult to treat because you can't leave your house also to see a therapist, for example. So agoraphobia is a very extreme case of what happens when, when it's not treated properly. And so we're going to see, and I, I think the way that it's portrayed here in this clip of, uh, in Copycat is, uh, is very, very good. So I really like that. Two disorders in DSM-4 that were removed in DSM-5 and got their own category, which is obsessive compulsive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder, known as OCD and PTSD. And I just wanted to say about these two that I considered them, you know, working in exactly the same process uh, with the, the anxiety curve and 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 the same treatment, the, uh, the cognitive behavioral treatment is appropriate, especially for the OCD part. And I'm going to show you one more clip from the movie As Good As It Gets with Jack Nicholson, a very famous movie, won many Oscars. And the idea is that uh, when the, there is an anxiety, the person uses some sort of ritual to relieve that anxiety. So, uh, for example, you'll see him uh, locking and unlocking the door in order to rid himself of his anxiety. And he is what is called an OC. He washes his hands a lot. And, uh, and of course, the anxiety is from germs. It's very, very relevant in these corona times. And, uh, and that's why he washes his hands all the time. He washes it compulsively. So the compulsion is the behavior and the obsession is the, the, the thought that keeps penetrating your mind that something bad is going to happen. So you use some sort of ritual to relieve it and it can be quite arbitrary. When it comes to washing, it makes sense, but it can be totally arbitrary. So you can, you need to, um, to uh, let's say, remove your clothes in a certain way in order for nothing bad to happen. You can only type using your left hand and not your right hand or use certain uh, digits and not others. So you can't use, for example, even numbers because that, that's a bad sign and so on. So it is a sort of superstition uh, going very, very, very wrong. So it's not superstition. It's much, much worse than that. 
uh, but uh, and then the person believes that only if he does a very specific ritual, then uh, he can uh, avoid disaster. That's the idea of the OCD. So let's watch the Jack Nicholson clip. So how do anxiety disorders develop? We're gonna talk about it from a cognitive behavioral perspective, and we're gonna be talking about what's called the anxiety curve. The anxiety curve means that uh, anxiety has a certain pattern that it follows, no matter what kind of anxiety you're dealing with. And it's always that, that it's rising, gets to a peak, and then it's uh, decreasing gradually. So this is the anxiety curve. So it can be very different from diff for different kind of stimuli. So for example, if uh, there's an emergency brake when you're in your car and there's an, the car in front of you breaks suddenly and you brake immediately after it, uh, that would be very, very fast. So within seconds, you'll get to the peak of the curve and then it will take you a few minutes probably to, you know, if everything is okay and you don't, didn't get into an accident, then it will get you a few minutes to settle down and, and, and you know, uh, feel feel uh, right again. So that's uh, in the case of a of a, a sort of a car incident like that. But then, if we're talking about, for example, the matriculation exam in mathematics then this can be for days. So you can be stressful for days and get to a peak when you reach the test and then take another few days to, to, to maybe a few days is too much, but a few hours to, to feel right again. So, so, but it always has this pattern. That's the idea. It doesn't matter how, how long it takes, it always has this pattern. So um, the idea is that when, um, when people have anxiety disorders, what they do is, is that they do not experience the anxiety curve in its full. So they will start feeling anxiety and then they'll do something about it that will stop the anxiety curve. So that, for example, uh, the most common way of doing it is to avoid the situation. So let's say, for example, I'm feeling anxious about um, going to my aunt because she has a dog. So uh, I'm feeling a bit anxious and I know that, uh, that my parents are gonna take me to my aunt today. And then I, and then I say, oh no, uh, I have a math test. I have to stay home and study. I can't go. No, I can't go. And I, I insist I'm not going to my aunt. And so this way I am avoiding uh, seeing the dog and I am not experiencing the anxiety. That's the idea. Another way of doing it is by soothing yourself. And this is, for example, what I just said about obsessive compulsive disorders. So if I uh, lock and unlock my door three times, everything will be okay. So I soothe myself and then I don't feel the anxiety. Uh, I can soothe myself, of course, with alcohol, drugs, it doesn't matter. But as long as I do something external, I don't experience uh, the uh, anxiety curve. And, uh, and I can just escape the situation. That's a bit different than avoiding. So it's not like I avoided the thing altogether, but once I got there, I just ran. So that's, that's escaping. So when you do that, what happens is, oh, I can't go back. What do I do now? Okay. 
so when I do that, what happens is that uh, I feel that the, the anxiety will just uh, continue to grow and grow. So I only had this part of the anxiety curve, and that means that I can't, that if, if it continued, it would just go on and on until forever, and I would never feel relaxed again. So what happens is that when you avoid once, you can see it here in this uh, little uh, picture, this little figure, uh, then you see that um, if I avoid it the first time, the next time I'm going to face this challenge, it's going to be worse. My subjective feeling of anxiety is going to be worse. So the first time I told my parents I have a math test and I can't go, the, what, so my, my subjective feeling, I have just been saved. And so uh, I didn't experience what it is. If I went to my aunt, then it would decrease because I would have survived it. Nothing would have, you know, hopefully nothing critical would have happened. I would have just seen the dog and everything would have been fine. But since I avoided it, the chances that I will do it again next time are lower now. My subjective feeling of, of uh, anxiety has increased because of uh, my avoidance. So that's the way that an uh, anxiety disorder uh, form. So the, you avoid things, so you don't want to see, you know, for example, uh, you, you don't want to drive. So you had a bad experience, you don't want to drive, and then you don't, every time you make an excuse, and every time there, the, the feeling comes up again, it's worse. And, and then you can see how we uh, formulate the treatment by the same principle. So, if once you avoid things, the anxiety becomes worse, then exposure will make it better. So you need to actually go through with the, uh, with the frightening experience and then you'll find it less and less frightening. Of course, it needs to be gradual. If you'll do it and it will be traumatic, then of course, uh, it will only make you feel worse. So, uh, so in CBT, what we would do is map all the frightening situation that the child avoids, create a hierarchy of threatening situations, uh, and then gradually expose the person to the situations as, uh, uh, as the time goes by. So, for example, let's say that uh, the person is afraid to um, go out of the house. So you wouldn't start with giving him a 30, 30 minute hike out of his house. You would start with small, um, gradual tasks of leaving the house for a minute. And then, you know, uh, maybe part of, the, of it being gradual would be that in the first time he would do it with his mother and the second time with a friend and only then alone and so on and so forth. And then, Gradually, uh, you, you will see the subjective experience decrease. That's what we see in this slide. And, uh, and then uh, you can overcome your anxiety. So that's the basic principle of CBT with anxiety disorders. It's very, very simple, very straightforward, and very effective. And it's all transparent. So anyone who comes to see me at my clinic for anxiety disorders, I would explain this whole thing uh, to the child, to his parents, and uh, uh, adults can also benefit from this kind of, uh, of treatment. And that's the idea, that you, you gradually expose the person to the source of uh, their anxiety, and this way the anxiety decreases. So, um, let's talk a bit about what causes the anxiety. What, what is the etiology? So one model is the temperament model. And when we talk about temperament, we're basically talking about the genetics, uh, the genetics of personality. So when you're born in the first two weeks, uh, scientists can identify your temperament. Some people are very hyper, some people are very quiet, and some people, and this is what we're talking about here, 
have this pattern, it's about 10 to 15% of infants have this pattern called behavioral inhibition. And this pattern is characterized by withdrawal, cessation of speech, cessation of behavior, seeking comfort and relaxation when you face a new stimuli, a new stimulus. So uh, you, you, they show you something new, they give you a new toy, and the, the first thing you do is you cease to do anything. So you don't talk, you don't, uh, uh, you don't do anything, you just uh, freeze in sort of a way. And at the same time, when, you, when they look at the baby's uh, physiological uh, measures, then you see physiological arousal at the same time. So, they, so something new would cause some kind of subjective anxiety, fear, and, and then uh, the sort of a freezing kind of response. And when you look at these babies and you look at them over the years, you see that a lot of them have anxiety disorders uh, later in life. Another very important model is the family factors model. So when we talk about anxiety, we're talking about, you know, it being hereditary uh, and that um, there's something genetic about it. But way beyond the genetics, we see uh, uh, that uh, it is, it is uh, transferred from uh, parents to uh, children because of their behaviors and not just because of genetics. So genetics only accounts for 30 to 40 percent of the variants. But uh, the, the fact that the parents are uh, prone to anxiety and the way that they behave is one of the primary things that causes anxiety in children. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about, first of all, parental over control. So when parents are very controlling, when they try to really uh, make sure that the kids are safe, and so they're over-regulating, they're intrusive, they're overprotective. they don't allow them for enough independence, then uh, we see that these children have a lot more uh, uh, a chance to become, uh, to develop uh, an anxiety disorder. So um, when the parent has an anxiety disorder, then first of all, what we see is uh, that they give a very bad role model. So, the, the, you know, for example, let's take the, the classic example of a child running in the playground and falling uh, on the, their knees. So uh, once the child fa uh, falls, the first thing he or she does is to look at their parents. That's the first thing that a kid does when they fall. So they, they don't, they want to make sure, uh, they want to see the parent's reaction. And once they see that the parent is anxious, they will start crying if they see that the parent is sort of relaxed and telling them, you can do it, you can, you can get up, then the child will be able to get up. So um, I'm not saying to, to tell kids that, you know, nothing happened if, if they're, you know, they broke their skin and they're bleeding, of course. Uh, you need to acknowledge that. But you need to also show kids that you, you're an adult and you have faced uh, things like that and you're able to face them. You're not, you know, you're, this is the, 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 the word that in Hebrew they use a lot, containment. Hala, containment. That's what it means, that when you see someone's emotions, you don't uh, get all rattled. You're able to contain these emotions. Another thing is the cognitive structuring that these parents provide their kids. So they are basically telling them that this world is a dangerous place. And when they tell them that, that that structures the world cognitively for the child and everything is dangerous. You need to be careful. Uh, and then when they perceive threats everywhere, then the kids are, they withdraw more. They don't try as much. They're not as independent uh, as other kids. Again, leading to anxiety disorders. Uh, and, um, and uh, so all these sort of behaviors together are, are the things that transmit the anxiety disorder from parents uh, to, to children. Paradoxically, these parents who are so controlling and so um, they want to regulate and make sure that their kids are doing the right thing all the time, they feel a lot less parental self-efficacy than parents who allow their kids more independence. So we have this uh, paradox and this uh, 
vicious cycle when the parents are, they have low parental self-esteem and then they have more controlling behavior and then they actually make their kids uh, be less independent and perhaps uh, have anxiety disorders uh, as well. So we need to always consider whether parenting is protective or supportive. And of course, leaning towards the supportive and not the protective. So uh, the best way to sort of help kids uh, develop independence is to support them and tell them you can do it and not to uh, over protect and not to over frighten them with the, the dangers of this world. So parents need to expose children to stimuli that frighten them rather than shielding them. This is also very relevant to teachers, for example. I'll give you an example of the way that, uh, that uh, teachers can sort of enhance or exacerbate an anxiety disorder. So for example, if uh, a very lovely uh, child tells you that he feels anxious about the test and, you know, he he would like it to be tested separately in the library. And he says, that, says it so nicely and nice language and everything. And you say, oh, of course, why not? I am a containing teacher and I want to really help this, this student. So I'll, I'll let him uh, take the test uh, in the library instead of taking it with the whole class. And this is third grade and, and this expands. And so all the other teachers also allow uh, this uh, student to uh, take the tests in uh, in the library and then he gets to uh, uh, seventh grade and he's now in middle school and all of a sudden uh, it's not that uh, considerate and uh, and and so what will happen at this point is that um, is that you'll have to work very hard as teachers as parents to help this child develop independence and even worse it can be the beginning of an anxiety disorder. So that it begins with, I cannot handle taking tests with the rest of the class and continue, I cannot handle crowds and, and so on and so forth and develop into some sort of uh, very uh, uh, de debilitating um, anxiety disorder. And when parents are overprotective, the children do not learn to deal effectively with fears and this is, increases their anxiety and places them at risk for developing anxiety disorders. This is from uh, uh, also a very good book in Hebrew called the uh, Pchadim Shel Yeladim, Children's Fears by Omel and Le Parents have all sorts of problematic beliefs, myths that need to be refuted. Uh, for example, they think that they're saving the child when they're uh, not letting them be exposed to the frightening stimulus. And that's, of course, uh, the other way around. Once you don't expose them to what frightens them, then you're actually uh, on the path to a, an anxiety disorder. Uh, another word that is used uh, frivolously, I would say, is uh, trauma. So everything is traumatic. I had a trauma with my math teacher. I had a trauma since I went. Trauma is a very, very serious thing. Do not use it lightly. Trauma uh, in its psychological definition is when you do not experience your, yourself the same since you've experienced a certain event. So once you've experienced that event, you feel everything is different. You're not the same person. That's the definition of trauma psychologically. There are many stressful events during life and most of them are not traumatic. And so, uh, when you expose a child, for example, let's take, let's take the example of the dog that I was talking about. When you expose a child to the dog and you show him, this is your aunt's dog. Yes, it barks a lot, so it's a bit aggressive. But once you do that, you do not cause trauma. You're actually doing the other, it's the, uh, the polar opposite. You're actually protecting the child by, by showing them they can handle uh, things like uh, looking at a barking dog, for example. Um, another thing that parents do is that they rely on their instincts. It's sort of a bare mother instinct to, uh, uh, to protect their child. So I need to listen to my instincts. No, you don't. No, you have bad instincts. 
And these instincts can lead to an anxiety disorder. So uh, don't rely on your instincts. Uh, you can rely on the literature. You can rely on a lot of experience about how to raise kids. Um, and that uh, rescuing the children from anything that may cause them distress is good parenting. There's a lot written about that. Also by a Hebrew, psych Hebrew University psychologist named Eitan Levov. He talks a lot about that, that we're, we're getting parenting wrong. Parenting is not about rescuing kids from distress. Parenting is not having, is not about providing kids with a lot of easy experiences. The other way around, you need to help kids uh, cope with, with things. Um, another myth is that the child is just incapable. And once you think that way, you perpetuate the difficulties because and you say, she's incapable of, uh, of dealing with this, and then she is incapable. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And finally, that if you do that, it will disrupt your relationship with the child as a parent. And, uh, and parenting is not all about providing good, you know, fun experiences all the time. So uh, uh, providing kids with uh, difficulties that they have to challenges, that they have to cope with, is a very important aspect of uh, parenting. So uh, the treatment of anxiety, I already spoke about that. Um, and I spoke about the principles and CBT is the most effective treatment for anxiety. It shows a very high percentage of uh, success with uh, the uh, therapeutic efficacy maintaining maintained over years. And about the efficacy I, and the maintenance, it's very important to note that Everything is transparent about this uh, sort of treatment. So when, when, when I treat someone for anxiety with CBT, I give them all the information, I tell them about the anxiety curve, and then it's sort of a vaccination for, for future events. So you know that once it begins, you know to identify it and immediately expose yourself to, to the problem. And if you do that correctly, then you don't need uh, three months of therapy with a, a clinical psychologist because you stopped it and you, you nipped it at the bud. Immediately when you started saying to yourself, oh, maybe I should come back to the house and check if I, if I, um, if I left the gas on, then you say to yourself, no, this is the beginning of anxiety and I need to prevent that obsessive response and go to work and feel safe about the way that I've, um, the way that I've handled it. So psychoeducation is teaching people all about the anxiety curve and the way that anxiety develops and physiological engagement is also very important. So you teach, uh, you can teach things like progressive muscle relaxation. You can use biofeedback and all these things to manage your physiology. Uh, the cognitive restructuring, not seeing the world as dangerous, uh, seeing the challenges and thinking that you can uh, cope with them. You teach problem solving, so you have difficulties. How do you how do you solve them in your day to day life? And of course, the most important thing that I uh, hope I stressed enough in this lecture: the gradual exposure to the stimuli that frighten you, and uh, preventing relapse is also what I spoke about before about this vaccination. So you know to identify the triggers, and once it begins, you immediately. Uh, uh, encounter them directly. So uh, the three rules of anxiety, I've adopted them, uh, adapted them from uh, Daniel Levy. So uh, the first thing is that you rebel against your anxiety. Whatever your anxiety tells you to do, you do the opposite. It's called rebellion against anxiety. The second rule, uh, if, if you're in doubt, there's no doubt, it must be the anxiety. So if you're not sure if you're feeling anxious or you just don't wanna to go to that party, then it's the anxiety telling you not to go. So you need to rebel against her. So what we're doing here also is a very important cognitive restructuring uh, technique called, called externalization. So we're not talking about you being anxious, we're talking about the anxiety as an entity that is controlling your life and making it worse. So we together we identify the way that anxiety is uh, is making your life worse, and once we are in agreement that it is making your life worse, we're rebelling against it. 
we don't we don't want it to control your life anymore we want to take control of our life uh, and so uh, so the second rule is that you uh, if you're in doubt there's no doubt and the third rule is that everything is gradual so you don't have to do it immediately there is this um, old-fashioned uh, technique called exposure uh, flooding sorry called flooding where you uh, you know if someone has a fear of in insects then you put them in a coffin full of uh, insects uh, cockroaches and spiders it doesn't work it's not a good idea so you have to do things gradually not uh, not by flooding the person and finally you always have to think and ask if um, the the event the uh, uh, the stimulus that you're encountering is it scary or is it dangerous i have this whole story about bees but i won't i won't tell it now because the lecture is becoming quite long uh, but for example if you have if you look at bees right you can feel very very scared but then you need to sometimes get some information and understand whether they're really dangerous or is it just that you're uh, feeling scared uh, so uh, I hope that uh, covers it, and uh, we'll continue uh, next time. Bye-bye.